I know that uh, for a while you were the executive director of the Cities of Refugee Ministries. Mm -hmm. uh, so you were uh, helping with transitional housing and employment opportunities for people dealing with uh, addiction, reentry, mm -hmm. homelessness. And, and we do see some of those things in this novel. Um, how much does your training and your experience play into this story? Actually, we can go back even further. So Cities of Refuge comes uh, after... Uh, uh, you know, because I was a scientist for a while, that you know, ended up going, going putting that all that away. And uh, as, as I'm trying to figure out what's next, I end up uh, partnering with someone, and we start Cities of Refuge. But all of that happens uh, five years after. So uh, we go back to the Knights of Breton Court series. So Knight, Knight of Breton Court, that was uh, basically the Legend of King Arthur, um, told. Uh, set here in, in modern Indianapolis and is told through the eyes of unhoused teenagers and, and gang members. Uh, because at the time I was uh, volunteering at a, a, a ministry for homeless uh, teens. And so, uh, so that, was that, that was actually the, the beginning of, uh, of, of me working in that area. So I, you know, I, I worked for, for that, the, the homeless teen ministry, work, worked there for a while. Uh, we'll go through, start uh, cities of refuge as uh, you know for adult men, and then all that sort of feeds into. So, so we have all of that plus all of my community organizing world that it sort of feed into uh, unfadeable at this point. Gotcha. And when you're talking about subjects um, like homelessness, like um, um, yeah, like homelessness, when you're dealing with that and you're not writing uh, urban fantasy that we both know is whore, but that you're writing for um, younger readers uh, to, mm -hmm. to enjoy, um, do you, um, I don't know, pull your punches a little bit is the right word, but soften some of the darker truths about, uh, about the reality uh, of homelessness and, 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 and the nature of the what's going on in the story without spoiling? Nope. Okay, good story. <laughs> <laughs> well, because when the things, uh, you know, because and I'll have, the, I've had, had these sort of conversations with like my editor and things like that because uh, I work with, I, like I said, I work with middle school students and so A, I know how smart they are but B, I also know how much they have to deal with. Um, there's a lot that they deal with that people just don't even realize they, they deal with. Like, and again, ha having worked in the homeless teen ministry, it's like, I know how many homeless teenagers there are. Uh, I know their, their, their precarious housing situation and how many end up unhoused and how many are couch surfing. I mean, it's, uh, people would be stunned to know just what, what these kind of numbers are, right? And uh, I know these are the things that uh, the students are dealing with on, 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 on a regular basis. So there's a whole lot of, you know, this, this dark reality that I think we're shielding them from, but it's like, yeah, but they are there. This is their world. I'm literally just writing about their world. And so uh, so I don't feel the need to pull punches because life hasn't pulled any punches on them. So uh, we, we just take it from there. And, the, and that's part of one of the themes of the book is how life has not pulled any punches uh, on, on Bella just because she's a teenager. So plenty of life has happened that she has to deal with. And so she, this is where we are. And this is a story that uh, she ends up having to deal with. It is sort of an absurd notion that uh, teens or uh, middle grade uh, readers would have to live in this world, but wouldn't be able to read about it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. So uh, like with usual sp suspects, I mean, uh, the students in usual suspects, that is their lived experience, what, what happens in that book. That is literally their lived experience. Um, they are labeled from a young age. They have to learn how to navigate the world uh, with this label on them and then still figure out what does it mean to have autonomy? What does it mean to have agency? And what does it mean to try and take the world on, on, on their terms? Uh, with Unfatable, um, yes, she's young and, and there's a very complicated uh, set of situations that she now has to find herself, especially going up against, you know, what could, at some points, government level corruption that she's trying to deal with as a 14 year old. And, and the, the situation is complicated. The situation is complicated for adults, <laughs> much less for, for teens. But that's part of the commentary. She's just like, wait, hang on. This is the system y'all have come up with in order just to come up with an art project, money for an art project. This is the system a bunch of grown folks got together and said, oh, this is the way we need to do things. 
this is ridiculous. And that's part of the commentary of, uh, of Unfatable, because, yeah, a lot of our systems are fairly ridiculous in how we do things. It's hard to uh, get annoyed with a teenager that says this this is terrible when you, they got a point. Yeah. Right. They got a point. <laughs> well spun. <laughs> I know that your style does change somewhat when you're writing middle grade versus when you're writing adult. Mm -hmm. um, other than a shorter word count and more frequent uh, paragraphing, what, what, what are things that you change about your style for a uh, middle grade audience? Yeah, I can't cuss as much as teenagers actually do. So there's that. So. <laughs> that is a shame. <laughs> right. Um. <laughs> cool, fine with it, but uh, some librarian, who we love librarians, but some adult love librarians. Would, uh, would, would take offense uh, and, and let everyone know online, I'm sure. <laughs> no, uh, no. The thing that I, I don't know of how much I actually do change writing style um, because I don't really I don't do students anyway, right? So, uh, so when I'm talking to I uh, when I'm talking to my my students, I don't talk to them much differently than I'm talking to you right now. I, I just don't. Uh, I might simplify some of the sentences, but I never simplify the the ideas. It's like uh, the ideas, they can either wrestle with the ideas or I expect them to rise to the, the, to the occasion, which they do. Um, because like I said, middle school students are way smarter than we, we uh, tend to give them credit for as, as adults. So uh, they have no problems rising to the situation. I mean, because I mean, think of it this way. Think of the complicated world we live in, the, 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 the levels of technology that could frankly baffle me to no end. It does not take them very long to, you know, define that 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 technology and 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 bend it to their advantage, because they're brilliant, right? And so I I just carry that through through other areas of life. It's like, oh, you know what? These students are brilliant, and so I can take complicated, I don't know, tax law or whatever, and uh, as long as I present it in a way that's interesting. That's the thing that counts. It's like, can I make it interesting? Can I make it entertaining? And I and, and that's not me doing something different from middle grade. That's me doing my job as an author. <laughs>